keep saying the next section. This is 2.2 we're starting now for the record. And 2.2 is inverses, a very important topic. We've learned to do some arithmetic with matrices, assuming that the dimensions match. We can add matrices and we can subtract matrices and we can multiply matrices. So one thing is noticeably absent from that list. Can we divide matrices? And the answer is sort of. So let me start by saying that in this section, we are looking exclusively at square matrices, n rows, n columns. If we've got a rectangular matrix, the answer to this question is just a fat no, and there is nothing else to say. Let's think about real numbers. Let's say we have one real number divided by another real number, two divided by three. Notice that we could think of division in terms of multiplication. The real number two divided by the real number three is the same as taking the real number one third and multiplying it by the real number two. And that's how we're going to approach this matrix division. We'll think of division as multiplication, just like we are doing here. In this real number context, dividing by three is the same as multiplying by one third. And what's the relationship between three and one third? Inverses. They're inverses. They are multiplicative inverses, which is the same as saying that three times one third equals one. So say we want to divide one matrix by another. And I should say right up front, we never use that terminology. Like your textbook will not say anything about dividing matrices by other matrices. But that is basically what we're trying to do. Well, to think of division in terms of multiplication in the real numbers, we talk about these multiplicative inverses. For matrices, we do the same thing. But Obviously, there has to be some kind of variation. So the inverse of A written as A with a negative one sign up here 
is the matrix with the following properties. And here's where we need to sit and think for a bit. Um, back in the real numbers, you can define the inverse by saying that their product is one. Well, with matrices, writing this is a nonsense statement. One is a real number, A and A inverse are matrices. You cannot multiply these and get a real number. But thinking way back, here we go. We have this matrix I that we said is acting like the one of matrix multiplication. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this matrix I to define the inverse. And because we know that matrix multiplication isn't commutative, it's not obvious that A times A inverse being I forces A inverse times A to be I. So we have those as two separate conditions. I am like, 90% sure that these are mathematically equivalent. I think that if we have one, we get two automatically and vice versa. Not 100% positive about that though. We'll state it as two definitions or two conditions. So thinking of inverses as multiplicative inverses, we know that every real number does not have a multiplicative inverse. But for the real numbers, there is only one that doesn't have an inverse. Zero has no multiplicative inverse. So you would at least expect that not every square matrix is going to have a multiplicative inverse. I mean, you would at least suspect that the zero matrix doesn't. But actually, I mean, you'd be correct, but we're going to make a stronger statement. There are matrices that have no zero entries, but still do not have an inverse. So, there are a lot more matrices that don't have inverses than there are real numbers.
numbers. For real numbers, there's just a zero that doesn't have an inverse. For matrices, there are an infinite number of matrices that don't have an inverse. Having said that, I'm not going to try to quantify this formally, but I will say that most square matrices have inverses. So I've made this observation, not every matrix has an inverse. It's not just the zero matrix. In fact, there are matrices that have no zero entries, but don't have an inverse. However, most square matrices do. And the second statement is reflected in our terminology. A singular event is a rare event, a once in a lifetime event. A singular matrix has no inverse. And again, that terminology is going back to this statement I made here. It's a singular event for a matrix not to have an inverse. It's a rare event. And the, the sister definition, if a matrix is non-singular, it does have an inverse. To, um, to drive home this statement that most square matrices have inverses, let's look at the special two by two case. Let's look at matrices with two rows and two columns. There's a formula that you can use to take a matrix like this and just get the inverse back again. And I don't think you should memorize this formula, but I'm going to put it on the board for you. And the point I want to make based on this form to the, why would a matrix not have an inverse? Well, this form to the has division in it. There would be no inverse. If this A, D minus B, C gave you a division by zero error. Otherwise, there is an inverse. So you see the only way for a two by two matrix to not have an inverse is if its entry is a satisfy this very specific equality. 
it. And if you generate a matrix at random, there's basically no chance that you are going to generate A, B, C, and D such that they satisfy this equality. Now, having said that, we don't in the real world tend to be working with random matrices. So saying that if you randomly generate the matrix, it will have an inverse is maybe kind of a deceptive statement. There are real world situations where singular matrices show up. We want to state some theorems. I think we're going to maybe run out of space, but that's okay. Theorem one. If a is invertible, then AX, the matrix equation, AX equals B, always has a unique Solution. So this theorem is kind of illustrating the power of inverses, because if A is invertible, you can just explicitly solve for X without any reference to Gauss-Jordan elimination. If A is invertible, you can take this equation and multiply both sides of it by the inverse of A. On the left, A inverse times A is R. Again, on the left, remember that the identity I is the one of matrix multiplication. So I times X is X. And having this inverse has allowed us to explicitly solve this matrix equation. The unique solution is X equals A inverse times B. So that's a nice theorem, although I'm going to have things to say about this at the end of the class. Theorem. If a is invertible. You know, notice that I'm very frequently just going to use the word invertible instead of non singular, because if I use the word non singular, then everyone in the class, including me, has to pause for a second to remind themselves of what that means, whereas invertible is very clean. So if A is invertible, so is A inverse. And the inverse of the inverse is the original matrix. 
Um, this should be exactly what you expect from the real numbers. Like two has a multiplicative inverse of one half. One half has a multiplicative inverse of one over one half, which is two. So the statement that the inverse of the inverse is the original quantity is exactly what you would expect. And the proof is, the proof is trivial. I mean, to say that a inverse inverse equals a, well, what do we need? We need to take a inverse and we need to multiply it by a and we need to get i and we do because that's the definition of the inverse. Similarly, a times a inverse equals i. That's the definition of the inverse. So just like a inverse is the inverse of a, a is the inverse of this. The next statement is maybe a little less intuitive. This is a statement to do with products. If A and B are invertible, so is A times B. And the inverse of A times the inverse of B. Sorry, uh, let me try that sentence again. The inverse of A and B is the inverse of A times the inverse of B. Once again, that's what you would expect if you have real numbers, two times three inverse, is one half times one third. But there's a hitch because we multiply these inverses in reverse order. So the inverse of AB is B inverse times A inverse. It does not perfectly parallel what we have with the real numbers. And the proof of this is, if I'm claiming two things are inverses, I'm claiming that multiplying them gives me i. So I'll just, I'll just multiply a, b, by B inverse, A inverse, and I'll see if I really do get I. Well, B times B inverse is the identity. And multiplying by the identity is like multiplying by one. It doesn't do anything. So we can erase that I. And then we have A times A inverse. This is the identity. So when we multiply this and this, we do indeed get the identity matrix. And properly speaking, you should also do the multiplication in the other order. 
but it works out exactly the same. This A inverse times A gives you I, then B inverse times B gives you I. Let's see. Uh, just for the record, it's in the textbook. As I say, we're really not going to be doing a lot with transposes, but for the record, if A is invertible, come on, if A is this, this pen is not cooperating. If A is invertible, so is a transpose and a transpose inverse is a inverse transpose. In general, it's not at all obvious at the moment how to find inverses. And that should probably be our next big, big project. Well, not that big. We're going to do it in a class period or two. But before we can talk about finding inverses, we need to go on what might seem like a detour that sort of has nothing to do with what we've been talking about so far. I promise that this is going to loop back and be irrelevant. But let's define an elementary matrix. An elementary matrix is any matrix tricks that you get by performing a n element Tree row operation on the identity matrix I. So, for example, if we look at the three by three identity matrix, swapping a row is an elementary row operation. So the matrix we get by swapping the first and the second row is an elementary matrix. Um, multiplying the first row by two and adding it to the second row is an elementary row operation. So if we multiply the first row by two, and add it to the second row, we 
get this. And this is an elementary matrix. And so on. Every elementary matrix is gotten by taking the identity and performing some row operation on it. Here is something that is not obviously true, but is true nevertheless. Left multiplication by an elementary matrix performs the row the um row operation. that was used to create the elementary matrix. And I don't know how clear this is, but let's take one, 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 two, 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 three, three, three. And that's left multiply it by this elementary matrix. Zero, one, zero. One zero 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 one. So this will be a three by three matrix. First row, first column. Zero, two, zero. First row, second column, zero, two, zero. First row, third column, also two. And if we complete this multiplication, we wind up with the matrix two, 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 one, 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 three, three, three. In other words, we have swapped the first and the second row. And this is an elementary matrix because it's gotten by taking I and performing a row operation on it. In particular, this is gotten by taking I and swapping the first and the second row. So you see that multiplication by this matrix that was gotten by performing a row operation performs that row operation. This is apparently a hard limit of 20 slides. Let me start back at frame one as I erased. Nope, just frame one. Okay, so what this means is that Gauss Jordan elimination 
can be thought of as a sequence of matrix multiplications. So we start with a matrix. We perform our first row operation. That's the same as multiplying by a matrix. We perform our second row operation. That's the same as multiplying by an elementary matrix. And we keep performing these row operations until the result is a matrix in reduced row echelon form. I'm not saying that this is the, a very natural or a very helpful way of um, doing Gauss-Jordan elimination. I'm just saying that you could think of it this way if you wanted to. Huh. We are in a very awkward place in terms of we're not going to quite finish this section. Let me state one more preliminary theorem. And then that's fine. We're like 10 minutes behind where we want it to be. We'll certainly do this on Tuesday. Um, let's state one preliminary theorem. Let's see. Every Elementary matrix is invertible. And the reason for that, the reason for that is that every elementary row operation can be undone by another elementary row operation. You swap two rows, you can swap them back again. And the elementary matrices of those two row swaps will be inverses of each other. You multiply a row by five, you can multiply the same row by one fifth. And those two elementary row operations will be inverses of each other. And likewise, you multiply a row by a constant and you add it to a second row. You multiply the row by that negative constant and add it to the second row. Those row operations undo each other and their elementary matrices are inverses of each other. And we're now able, but we don't quite have the time to, to state and prove our main theorem for how you can find inverses and how you know whether a matrix is invertible or not. I'll, um, I'm you, well, you four or three of you are here, but you can do that homework after we finish this uh, section on Tuesday. It will just take maybe 20 minutes of lecture to wrap things up. My online students, I'll tell them it's 20 minutes. Please just finish this up and get the homework in at the usual time.